Hello, my wonderful croissant friends. My dear friend, you will let me know that when I let YouTube's auto captioning do its own thing, when I say croiso friends or welcome friends to all of you, it captions as croissant friends. And I think that's just delightful. And I think I've settled on what I'm gonna be calling you lovely people from now on, which should please tornado. Today, I'm starting on a project that I've had in the back of my mind for a while, a Viking coat. I'm using air quotes quite deliberately there, as it will become apparent as we go on, the numerous ways in which this project deviates from historical practice, which I'm 100% okay with because sometimes you just want something historically adequate and pretty. A few months ago, I, last year, um, sometime last year, I bought some delicious diamond twill and cream and charcoal from a friend who was destashing a lot of her fabric in preparation for a move. I knew I wanted it for a Viking coat and I had the idea to trim it in red. So this project will be in two parts, making the trim and making the coat. Today, we're diving right into weaving. So grab your cuppa. Today, I am drinking a very indulgent cup of wittered peanut butter, hot cocoa and marshmallows. Thanks to Jen, who routinely sends me the most delicious goodies from England. And let's get into it. In order to weave, we need a loom, right? Well, not actually, as it turns out, but today I will be using one. It's what's modernly known as an ankle loom. The word ankle goes back to the medieval period and translates to ribbon or tape, but this particular style of loom can only be dated back to the early 1900s. Narrow wares like trim or ribbon were more likely woven with a backstrap method where one end of the working yarn was tied to a fixed object like a tree or a hook in the wall and the other fastened to the weaver's belt, allowing tension to be maintained with the body. The weaving would be accomplished through the use of cards or a rigid heddle that would move certain threads up and down to allow the weft thread to pass back and forth. Okay, I know that was a whole bunch of weaving jargon and I promise I will explain most of it as I go along, but maybe I should do a whole video on the different kinds of looms and weaving that were available pre-industrial era. Even just the systems available for narrow wares like ribbon or tape would be enough to make a whole video on. Let me know in the comments if this is something that might appeal to you. What I'm doing here that production assistant Bran is so cleverly helping with is making heddles. Usually when we think of looms, we think of a machine where one set of threads stays in one place and there is a device that moves the other set of threads above and below the stationary ones, creating a space or shed for the weft threads to pass through. This device is called a rigid heddle and is not what I'll be using today. Instead, I'll be using string heddles that will keep one set of threads in one place while I manipulate the other set to create a shed above and below in order for the weft threads to pass through. This particular ankle loom was a gift from a very dear friend in the SCA who was always thrilled when I sent her pictures of it in use. Look, Auntie Serena, I made a whole video this time. Remember that silk thread that I used for my embroidered pilgrim's bag? I got some more of it, this time in red from Aowen. It's about to weave up so beautifully. First though, I need to load up my shuttle. A shuttle is a device that's designed to hold the weft thread as it passes back and forth. Narrow wear shuttles like this one usually have one side that's blunt and one side that has a sharper edge that can be used to beat the weft or make sure that it's pushed nice and tight against the already woven fabric. This particular shuttle is bone and somehow got broken between the last time I wove and now. It's still usable though. Okay. Time to warp or set up the loom for weaving. Using the same silk thread, I'll start at the very front of the loom, looping the thread around the pegs in order to fit three yards worth of finished trim in this one very compact space. In 
order to create the weave I want, every other thread will have a string heddle looped over it and secured to the bottom peg, and the alternating threads will be left free so that I can manipulate them to form the sheds. It's been too long since I've warped this loom, and I forgot that it's not just adding the string heddles that makes it possible to create the shed above and below the stationary threads, it's also alternating which top pegs the string goes over. The set of strings without heddles get looped over the far peg, and the set with heddles get looped over the near peg. This creates enough play within the free strings to create sheds both above and below the stationary set. Time to do the entire process again, except correctly this time. Now that the loom is correctly warped, you can see how easily I can create the sheds. I'm going to start weaving by securing the end. I'll put the thread in, leaving a bit of a tail, and then weaving the tail through the next pass, before continuing on using the thread on the shuttle. This secures the tail end of the yarn in a way that won't unravel when it's time to cut the trim off the loom. Here you can see me turn the shuttle to make sure that the sharper edge is facing me and thus the already woven trim. Using this edge allows me to push the weft threads together more tightly, which will make for a more uniformly woven trim.
is a craft that, much like others, requires practice to get right. You can see that the edges of my trim are coming out a little wobbly and not quite straight. This is because maintaining an even weft thread tension is trickier than it looks. I'm glad to say that my tensioning improved over the course of the project, though. When I get to a point where there is no more space to weave, I need to advance the warp. This peg here is the tensioner and it holds the weaving nice and taut. To advance the warp, I'll loosen the tensioner so there's lots of slack and then I can just slide the warp around easily. I think I forgot to mention earlier in this process that I tied the ends of the warp together to make a continuous loop which allows me to easily slide the work back and forth. When I have everything where I want it, I'll adjust the tensioner to the desired working tension and I'm off to the races once again. Once I have run out of weaving space, it's time to finish the end in the similar way to how we started. I'm going to place a needle in the weaving, the sharp end facing the same way as the working weft thread, which I have already cut off the shuttle, leaving a tail. Then I will weave one more row of working thread after the needle. I will then thread the needle with the tail end of the thread and pull it through, effectively locking the end of the weaving. Well, thank you for joining me today as I very competently warped my loom correctly on the first try, and thank you for staying with me when that absolutely did not actually happen. I guess I should probably commit to weaving a little more often so I don't lose track of how exactly to get started. I'm really quite pleased with how well the actual weaving went. Weaving is a craft that relies on even tension just like many other fiber arts like embroidery, knitting, or hand sewing. And it took me a little while to get back into the rhythm of it. The next half of this project will come out not in two weeks like I had originally anticipated, but in four because of some really fantastic, exciting news. Matthew Nagy of The Modern Maker is putting on a historically inspired costume competition guest judged by Samantha McCarty, known for her presence on social media as the couture courtesan and her amazing work in the historical costuming community. 
and I am entering. So I'm gonna be working on that costume over the next couple of weeks, which will include some pieces I already have, some pieces I have but intend to alter in some way, and also at least one new item, maybe two, that I will be making. So that video will debut on October 30th, just in time for Spooky Day, and the Viking coat video will be pushed back to November 13th. Okay, I think that's enough rambling from me. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you're the kind of person who likes being told when new videos are uploaded, make sure to click on the bell to turn notifications on. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook, and I will put a link to those in the description as well as to my coffee page if you would like to make a donation to the Alms Purse and help keep Opus LNI in materials and production assistant brand in treats. And remember, croissant friends, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Hui! So this project will 